Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. A special welcome if you're visiting with us. If you're here for the first time as part of our online service, it's great to have you with us and just trust that you'll feel at home. Well, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Uh, we're so thankful for you. Uh, we're blessed by all that all the wonderful things that you bring and have brought into the lives of your kids and your families. I uh, just want you to have a wonderful uh, Father's Day being celebrated today. And for those of you whom Father's Day is a difficult day, uh, our hearts certainly go out to you and are with you in, uh, in what isn't an easy day for you. I want to give a special thank you to our children's ministry leaders who have been uh, putting together uh, the lesson videos and the Zoom ministry gatherings on Sunday afternoons. I'm just so thankful for all of your work in doing that. We're on the cusp of our summer children's ministry season, so our summer will look a little bit different online, uh, but stay tuned and uh, keep tuning in on Sunday afternoons for our online children's ministry during the summer. Also, as many of you are aware, the government and uh, health advisors continue to give guidelines as to uh, quote unquote opening up of various parts of life in this COVID-19 season and through this time of pandemic. I just wanted you to know that uh, we are very aware and cognizant of what the government is advising and we continue to, as a church leadership, uh, discuss and talk uh, with ministry leaders as well and looking at what some of our next steps would be. So just encourage you to uh, be checking out our website regularly, be looking at our Facebook page regularly and also tuning into eLife. And as things change and as there are announcements about ministries, uh, they'll be posted there and you'll know what's going on as we make decisions, both in light of what the government is saying, but also uh, in light of uh, the needs of our church family what we can do and also what uh, what makes sense and also uh, pursuing health safety as well and uh, the spiritual needs of our church. Now, a special congratulations to a group of people out there. This season is not necessarily what you envisioned it would be earlier this year, but a congratulations to all of our graduates. So if you're graduating from elementary school, high school, uh, maybe a SAGEP tech or career program from trade school, a university undergrad or postgrad, just uh, our, our highest esteem, our congratulations, and just we want to celebrate you in this moment and uh, just congratulate you for all you've done and, you, and all that you've achieved and know that the Lord is going to continue to work in your lives in the days and the years ahead. Well, let's pray before we move into the rest of the service together. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we have today. Thank you for what you have to speak to us, what you've put on Basil's heart and mind. Thank you for what Chris is going to lead us in this morning in worshiping and praising you. And we just want our hearts and our minds to be open to you, and that we would receive from you and that we give to you what you are so worthy of. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, if you have any needs, please do contact the church and just have a great morning as we worship the Lord together and as we receive from him what he has for each one of us. God bless you.
This is the word of the Lord, Psalm 96. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Tell all the nations, the Lord reigns. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He will judge all peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and the nations with his truth. Amen. And now let's declare our faith together with Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Would you declare this with me? Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! situation and your goodness 
sustains me, Lord. I will bow in humble expectation of your presence in the Yes, there will be trial and tribulation, and you'll grant me the breath to persevere. May my heart be in pure anticipation of the day that you dry these tears. Only you have said. Earth on its foundations, only you give orders to the dumb, only you can know the depth of every ocean, only you deserve our song. Lord, you are the thunder to my whisper. Yes, your greatness knows no bounds. All these things too wonderful to speak of. Fill my soul with a heavenly sound. Only you have said. On its foundation, only you give orders to the dumb. You can know the depth of every ocean. Only you deserve our song. Only you have torn the cover. Time is 
Dear friends, and uh, welcome to our Sunday service here at Westview. Uh, my name is Basil Favis. For those of you who might not know me, um, I'm an elder at Westview and also uh, part of the preaching team. So, uh, dear friends, good to contact. Um, it's hard to have to always do this, of course, online. Uh, for many of us um, now, I think we're just passed through probably about the third month of going through this pandemic. Um, so we're actually starting to see uh, in Quebec some, some good news. So there is uh, lowest cases, I think, that have uh, ever been reported up to date. I mean, and uh, just around the 100 mark per day, um, things look to definitely uh, be getting uh, somewhat better. Um, we see hope there. Um, and also some, some difficult things that have passed since the last time I came and, and shared with you. So, um, um, one of the things is that with respect to COVID-19, we passed uh, in Quebec um, uh, the, the um, a landmark uh, number of 5,000 deaths. Um, so significant, horrible, difficult, um, and, um, and uh, something for us to, to talk about. And I'll be trying to relate some of that later on uh, during my sermon today. And also since the last time I talked to you, uh, racial unrest. Um, racial unrest that started uh, with the um, um, brutal um, uh, death of, um, of George Floyd um, in Minneapolis and has just spread like worldwide um, and has um, causing almost just about every nation to look at, 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 at racism and trying to understand the roots of it in their own communities. Um, there's something also that I'd like to relate to today um, in, in the message that, um, that I'll be sharing with you. So hard truths, uh, but hope, uh, hope from God uh, uh, in, in these, as you will see. Um, what I'll actually be doing today is I'm going to be opening up a, a new series for the summer. It's called Psalms Alive. Um, um, we will be right through the summer uh, looking at a variety of psalms related to certain themes. And um, the theme that we'll be looking at today is God's glory. And uh, you're going to see how God's glory and our understanding of God's glory is going to have direct impact on, on how we speak to some of the things that I've just been, been bringing up to you. So God's glory, let's, uh, let's look at this together. Um, 
The first thing that we can maybe ask is, what is God's glory? And I actually think God's glory is something that is, is uh, hugely misunderstood uh, or, or just kind of vague in our minds as to what really it is. And yet it's central to the Christian experience. Um, what is God's glory? God's glory is really nothing less than the full representation or the full essence of God as he truly is. Um, his full and complete divine nature. We have a couple examples of God's glory uh, that we often uh, refer to in Scripture. And one of the most well-known is with Moses in Exodus. So this is just prior to Moses uh, receiving the Ten Commandments. Um, um, and Moses is seeking vision here. Um, Moses says, and he's speaking to God here, now show me your glory. This is in Exodus 33. Uh, I'll be speaking from 18 to 23. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock, He's speaking to Moses. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not, must not be seen. This is a, one of the well-known um, um, referrals to and, and, and times in Scripture um, when we can think of, of God's glory. A second one, and I'll comment on this in a second, but the second one is at the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. So for this, we're going to be reading in, in Mark. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 4. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. So we see in these two scriptures... Um, God's glory um, in a really special way. I mean, in these two instances, when it's referring to Moses on the one hand and the transfiguration of Jesus on the other, in both cases, it's th there is actually a departure from anything we could actually understand in this world. It becomes otherworldly. Um, God's glory has to pass, and Moses could not even look at it completely. Um, there's a dazzling in the transfiguration. And what, what Scripture is telling us is it's, it's, it's to understand God's glory is to go outside of anything we could possibly comprehend within the structures that we use as people to understand this world. Things were happening. It's like a, I mean, it, it's just, it's just, otherworldly. It's out of this world. And it is, in fact, out of this world. Well, God's glory has to be out of this world because it is the full representation and the complete representation of who he is. And in fact, as we can see in the scriptures that I've just talked about, is that we can only actually understand snippets, parts, really, of God's glory. It is beyond our capacity, even as human beings, as we are uh, locked into the four dimensions of three dimensions of space and the four dimensions of time. It's beyond our capacity to understand this full concept of who this amazing God truly is in all he is, in all his divine attributes. So, we only can glance snippets of that glory. And yet we're going to see that to understand God's glory is going to be something that's essential to us as a faith. And that, in fact, God has made a way for us to be able to see representations of his glory here on this earth. 
The other thing about those two examples that I gave you, whether it's about Moses or the Mount of Transfiguration, is that these were all closely associated with almost mountaintop experiences. In the case of Moses, Moses, soon after this, this, this exposure to God's glory, he went up to the Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. In, in the case of the Transfiguration, it was going up onto a mountain to see the glory of God. And this is where even in, in, in popular culture now, we have this idea of, of going on the mountain and, 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 and coming into a mountaintop experience of God. But in both of those cases, there's a return to the valley. And it's in the valley that there is the working out of what God's glory truly means. And that's going to be important for us to remember. So God's glory is actually represented to us in many, many different ways. And this is where I'd like now to go into the Psalms, as this is the Psalms Alive series. Um, there's a number of beautiful Psalms that give us different representations of God's glory. So we see God's glory in his creation. Uh, let's turn to Psalms 104. Psalms 104 verses 1 to 4. We see the glory of God and what he has made. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. And another scripture relating to the glory of God and what he's made, Psalm 19 verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> In Psalm 19, we see again the beauty of God's creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And his creation goes on in that psalm to just talk about the magnificence of what God has made and how it is something where God is actually showing us the richness and the power and, and, and the knowledge and the wisdom in everything that has been created. These things are meant to put us into wonder at who God is, but it's a revelation of his glory to his creation. God's glory is also evident in his unending and limitless love for his people. And let's look to Psalm 63. In Psalm 63, verses 1 to 4, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. God's glory is evident in his unending and his limitless love. For his people and his glory evokes a response, a response of praise in his people. Psalm 113. In Psalm 113, we're going to be um, reading just the first two verses, uh, excuse me, uh, verses uh, three to nine. And in, um, in this particular Psalm, we see God's glory in his dominion over all people in his deep love to lift up the downtrodden and the needy. This is not a God who is far away from his people. Psalm 113, verses three to nine. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust 
and lifts the needy from the ash heap and seats them with princes. With the princes of their people, he settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. And God's glory is also seen in his desire to be intimate with us, to communicate with us, and to be involved in a relationship with us. Let's look at Psalm 138, verses 1 to 5. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted, you have exalted above all things, your name and your word. When I called, you answered. You made me bold and stout hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord. When they hear the words of your mouth, may they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. So that scripture tells us about how God's desire is to be intimate with us and to enter even into communication with us. And God's glory is revealed also through that. Um, All these revelations of God's glory, and we're going to see some of the more important ones yet to come, any revelation, all these revelations of who God is and how it's exhibited in in what we see in this world around us, in the action of God and the love towards his people, in his creation, in his desire to communicate with us and pray with us, and in in the praise that we respond with, this glory is, is meant to evoke a sense of wonder in us. And it actually turns out that as Christian and as people of faith, we need to have the sense of wonder of God. We need to have the sense of the glory of who God is, or else actually our faith will just try and shrivel up. So in a time of COVID-19, um, um, it's actually really important to talk about the glory of God, because in some ways in COVID-19, in the times of COVID-19, this is going to be some of the most difficult times for us to actually see God in his glory. There'll be a tendency to look to the negative, a tendency to look at what's not going right. And in these times of COVID-19, we need now more than ever to look into the glory of who our God is and who he is and all that he is, and to take strength and sustenance from that. Um, I feel that even myself, you know, as I'm going through COVID-19 um, and, and, and you get into the monotony of the day and as we, we've been taken away from things um, um, that would bring us renewal and differences and there's a certain monotony and a sameness to the day, um, um, we have to look to God, to who he is, to look beyond that and to, to just understand that through this and in all of this, God has not changed one moment. He is present in all his glory. He loves us as he has always loved us. His desire is to enter into relationship with us as never before. And he is fully and absolutely God right through in the beginning, in the midst, and at the end of this pandemic. God's glory In fact, the most perfect and the most important representation of God's glory is actually fully present in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 talks to us about this in a beautiful way. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
So God's glory is fully present in Jesus. And in Jesus, we enter also into God's glory. We enter into relationship through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the exact representation of God in all his fullness, and he is God. So the life of Jesus Christ is probably the greatest revelation of God that has ever been given and is the greatest revelation of God that has ever been given to humanity. If we want to see and have a clearest idea of who God is, the life of Jesus Christ is that clearest representation of all the attributes of God. And even then, his glory is beyond everything that we could grasp. But God in his wisdom saw fit not to place his glory somewhere out there, far away from us, but to become in himself, made man, walk, be present among us in the person of Jesus Christ and to bring his glory to live right among us. And for Jesus Christ, for us to be able to look to his life to be able to understand when we want to understand who God is, the person and the life of Jesus Christ is the greatest representation of God that we have. He is God. And he walked on this earth and he felt and he interacted with us and he understood the world that we live in. Second Peter chapter one, uh, verses three to four. <clears throat> says the following. It says that we actually, when we enter into relationship in Jesus Christ, we actually partake of that divine nature. We actually partake of this divine glory of God. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So we share in the divine nature of God. And the life again of Jesus Christ is the most is the most perfect representation that we have of God on this earth. I mean, when we look at the life of Jesus Christ and we just see the world that he entered into, the love, the compassion, the healing, the reaching out, um, the truth that was spoken, the wisdom that was spoken, we are seeing exhibited in Jesus Christ all the attributes, all the wisdom, the love um, of the infinite and absolute God actually exhibited here on planet Earth. So God, in, first, in, this, in this scripture in 2 Peter as well, is telling us that we're actually called to be partakers. We, we are called to enter in to the divine nature of God. We do not have a God that's going to be far off from us. We always have a God who wants to enter into a relationship with us. And in fact, the life, that life of Christ in us, as Christ is the perfect representation of God in, on this earth, the life of Christ in us, the life of Christ in us is the representation of God to this world in the 21st century and has always been the representation in whatever culture Christians have walked in. So sometimes we like to say, I wonder what it would look like if, if Jesus were to walk the streets of Montreal today. And it is an interesting thought experiment to do. But in fact, Jesus is walking the streets of Montreal today, and he is walking in the lives in each and every one of us. We are partakers of that divine nature. We are partakers of the divine glory of God. And God is calling us to be in relationship with him, to share in that, but not only to share in that, 
He is calling us to be people that declare his glory. So actually, our purpose as Christians is to be a form of is actually a declaration of God's glory. We are called to declare this amazing glory of God to us wherever we go. And through us, Jesus is walking the streets of the West Island. Jesus is walking the streets of Montreal in us. One of the most beautiful representations of this is in Jesus's own prayer as he talks about what this glory means. And it's in John chapter 17, and it is this famous prayer of Jesus. It is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. I'm just going to look at the end of it. John chapter 17, verses 22 to 25. And this is Jesus now speaking. It's all red letters here in the scripture I'm reading. Jesus is speaking. I have given them, this is talking about you and I, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as, you ha even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. We are called into perfect unity in Jesus Christ. And just as Jesus is one with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, we are called to be in unity and we share, we're partakers of the divine nature, partakers of this glory of God. And it is founded as it says here in Jesus' own prayer in the love that was given from the father to the son and the love that existed at the beginning of this dance of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, this dance of love, this amazing love, a love that is, 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 is beyond what we're able to imagine. But this love that is situated in who God is, is being made available to his children. And we are brought into that unity of love. I think when we begin to understand that, unity, we begin to understand another scripture, another scripture that I think is going to speak really, really importantly into the times in which we live. Um, Galatians 3.28. In Galatians 3.28, it says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you look at John 17, verses 22 to 25, those verses in the prayer of Jesus I just read, and if you look at Galatians, these two come together. God's desire is for a unity of love to exist. We are called also to declare this glory and this mission of love in the world that we live in. In fact, we are the image bearers of God and we go forth bearing the image of God and declaring his love and de declaring his love for this nation. But it also means that as people of God that we're called to speak out. We're called to speak out when we see injustices, when we see um, hatred, and when we see evil, deep, deep evil, and significant um, harm and destruction that is being done. So here's where I wanted to bring this to where we are today. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, um, we passed the 5,000 marks uh, uh, the, the 5,000 mark of, uh, of deaths in Quebec, a, a horrible mark, um, something that we're going to be remembering as part of our history here 
in Quebec due to COVID-19. Um, the amazing thing about this is that when COVID-19, when it comes into, and when it's come into, into our society, not just here in Quebec, but right around the world, as it rips through the society, it's almost as if this virus, it's like a magnet for wherever there is weakness. So people who are vulnerable and particularly, and so we can see amongst these 5,000 in Quebec, the vast majority have been above 70. And, 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 and this rip through the senior residence system here in Quebec, and it's exposing absolute weaknesses in the systems that we have built up as people here. And we bear responsibility for that. And us as Christians in particular, if we understand God's glory, if we understand God's love, if we understand the truth and the healing and the restoration that he desires to bring through his glory, and as people who are meant to declare his glory, we are called to speak out about this. And as COVID-19 has come, it's teaching us something, and it's teaching us something that we as a church need to take on and hold on to. COVID-19 didn't stop with just the seniors. It was an article in CBC that was looking at Montreal and Toronto, and now as, as enough information is coming in, it's becoming very clear that certain neighborhoods have, been just, have just been absolutely have been devastated by COVID-19, and that others much, much less. And it is generally where there has been inequality, poverty, um, uh, um, and, 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 and inequalities, basic human rights inequalities. And so in Montreal and in Toronto, COVID-19 has had devastating effects on black neighborhoods, for example, in both Montreal and Toronto. And this is outlined in the CBC article. Um, we see, um, um, as COVID-19 rips through and has almost like this homing pigeon for where weaknesses are and those weaknesses are exploited as people of God and for righteousness and for God's glory, we are meant to be a magnet, but not for destruction, but a magnet for righteousness, a magnet for, for, for restoration. But we're meant to see these things. And as people, as we walk and where we are, we're meant to sense the hurt of this and grieve and even lament for these things and then pass into an action as people of God and be involved in this. We cannot stand back. As COVID of 19, is effective at bringing in destruction into areas of weakness, we are meant now to bring in as people of God and as a community of believers and as a body of Christ, we're meant to bring restoration in many, many different ways to this world in which we're living in. The other thing that we've been seeing in, over the last month, as I mentioned before, is the is is the, the the tremendous protests worldwide over racial injustice, and it's just been phenomenal how this death of George Floyd, and now some other deaths as well that we are seeing that have followed that are just are just the spark now that have gone right across the world, and how people are responding to this sense of injustice. If we understand the unity and the glory of God and this unity of love that we have been called into, all forms of racial injustice, we need to be people of action as, as a body of Christ. What we need to be able to do and what's happening is that with the death of George Floyd, various Communities and cultures have been looking at their own communities. And if we're to look at Montreal and if we're to look at um, where we live and the communities where we, where we are living in Canada and in Montreal, there's no, it's become incredibly clear more than maybe even ever before, um, the systemic racism that's existed and that exists. 
So for the first time, we have the commissioner of the RCMP actually stating that there is systemic racism in the RCMP. We have uh, Valérie Plante, who was the mayor of Montreal and the Montreal and the chief of police of Montreal talking about systemic racism in the Montreal police. And this systemic racism is particularly accentuated towards the police and towards, uh, towards the black population and the Aboriginal population um, uh, in our country and in our communities. We have a great, great stain of inequality and racism towards the Aboriginal people. And this is becoming to come out. And um, there is a um, tremendous inequalities in terms of wealth, whether it be black or Aboriginal in Canada and, and in the Montreal area, uh, whether it be related to wealth, whether it be related to educational attainment, um, profiling by the police, things that are coming out. There are things that, discussions now that are starting. And as people of God, we need to have these discussions and we need to, 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 to come together. Um, scripture, um, when we are made to declare the glory of God, if we are made in unity to express God's love to this world, um, we need to take a stand for racial injustice. We can no longer stand back and be silent. And in fact, God is now calling us, I believe, to be part of ending the silence. If Jesus Christ is the most, is this beautiful representation of God as he walked on earth, what would the Lord's response be to this? It would be heartbreak, but there would be a rebuke as well to the society. And we need as people of God to be able to speak for God's glory, which is love, which is truth, and which is righteousness. So friends, um, God's glory and sensing his glory, God has represented his glory in many, many ways through his creation, through his love for us, through his desire to enter in with us in prayer. And we respond to him in praise. But God's glory is evident in the person of Jesus Christ and in the fact that we partake of that divine nature. And God's glory is present in the unity of Jesus and in that unity of love between the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and now to us. And we are called to go forth as bearers of that image, as speakers of truth, to declare God's love to this world and to not stand back in silence. And I think if anything now, the time of silence is over. And I saw a placard, I think, in, during one of the George Floyd uh, uh, protests, and it said, silence is violence. So silence is actually also destructive. And we're called now, we're called to enter in. Randy Trim um, sent out, um, something to a, a bunch of us and, and, and as he was just meditating on all of this and, and Randy's thought and, and message to us was to enter into a time of grief and lament. And so for those of you and brothers and sisters who are black and, 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 and we, we, we just ask, um, we, just, we just want to grieve with you. We cannot even imagine what you've been through. Um, but our hearts go out to you. teach us, help us to grieve, help us to lament. Teach us also in the way of repentance and allow us now in the name of God and in the name of Jesus Christ to be declarers of his glory and in declaring his glory to bring restoration to this world. This is our call in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. My dear friends, I just want to finish this, this sermon now with just, just a time of prayer. Let's just bring our hearts before God all together. Lord, I just lift up your name. I thank you for all that you are. You are a God of love. You did not stand afar away from us. You've revealed your glory to, his, to your people and you have interacted with us, you are there with us, you love us and you care for us. 
Lord, give us a heart, I pray. Give us the words that we need. Help us to grieve and to lament and to sense. Help us, O Lord, to not be a people that stand apart and are silent. Give us words, O Lord, to speak and help us to be a part of your restoration on this earth as we see your glory declared in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, there are 71 million forcibly displaced people in this world, people who have had to flee their homes to live in peace. They've left their family and all their support systems, their neighborhood and all that is familiar in order to live in safety and have a future for their children. 
Father, we thank you for their courage. And you are entirely aware for each family that has had to flee. You are a witness to each person who has been driven from their home, city, or country. You watch as people try to cross borders and enter and leave refugee settlements and make long and uncertain fear-filled journeys. You take note of people who place wisdom and offer them a home and welcome them and offer them hospitality. And you also know those who turn their backs on, the, on them. Many of us are descendants of refugees today and we're grateful that our parents and grandparents and great grandparents found a place of refuge. Thank you for bringing us to this land. Father, our own Bible is filled with refugees. We think of Hagar driven into the desert by those who owned her, of Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers, of Ruth and Naomi destitute running returning to Israel as refugees, of Jesus and his parents fleeing into Egypt. God, this has been going on since the beginning, so please hear the cries of your people, those who are lost at sea, from families carrying all they own, from men and women hoping the refugee settlement is safe for their children and for them, from children who are separated or lost or afraid or hungry, you know the sacrifice of each mother and father as they try to protect and provide for their children. You know what it's like to be accused and be innocent, to be mistreated, to be unwanted. Yet you love even your enemies and offer hope and home to those who killed you. We ask you to protect the vulnerable from those who would mistreat them. Jesus, you know Please let the displaced people of the world know that they are known by you. Help us to be known, to know you, and to know our brothers and sisters in this world who are struggling. This has been such a hard time, O oh God, for us to see your glory. We look around us and we're paralyzed by COVID in the air. Racial tensions over systemic racism mental health and family issues on the rise and displaced people all over the world who are stuck in between. They are waiting, they're in that in-between place. And this is what we see if we look around us, but you, O oh God, have a plan and a desire to bless this world. Help us to lift our eyes to you, to see what you would want us to see, to want to glorify you, and we want to see your glory. We are hungry for you, actually starving for your holiness to be known, for your love to be experienced. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you as we go our separate ways this week. Think about those around you who could use comfort. Go be a blessing. Bring shalom to those who are hungry and who are displaced, even in their own homes. We have so many people who are starving for contact. Pick up the phone, be a friend. Have a good week.